Yes, I'm back with you. Oh. Terry Nation was a man bursting with ideas. Sometimes his stories seem to have too many ideas for their own good. Like many talented writers, he threw in concepts with such casual confidence that the implications were not fully explored before his pacey plots moved on to the next point. In one flurry of creativity in the winter of early 1965, he came up with an adventure set on a world ravaged by climate change, a story about how time travel can create impossible mysteries in history, a fantasy world populated by fictional characters, and a disturbing encounter with a runaway robot civilization. Any one of these segments could have been expanded to be a full story in its own right, but instead they were all crammed in to an action-packed six-part roller coaster called The Chase. In this third Dalek serial, Nation characterized the Doctor as an inventor who rustled up all manner of useful gadgets, such as this unspecified explosive device, plus the TARDIS magnet and the time path detector, not to mention constructing the time machine itself. But in this episode, we are taking a look at one particular gadget that the Doctor invented, which sheds light on the troubling, godlike powers of the Doctor's own race, and leaves us pondering extremely disturbing implications about the Doctor's many victories over his enemies. If you'd like to support our research, contribute ideas, and see clips and early videos, then check out the link in the description on how to join our Patreon. The Chase introduces an impressive new gadget within the TARDIS. We would come to know this massive circular prop as the Time and Space Visualizer. In the broadcast episode, its place of manufacture is a mystery, and the Doctor is merely repairing it. However, in Terry Nation's original script, it's fairly clear that the Doctor has built the device himself to amuse his companions. This is how Terry Nation described the device in his draft script. An apparatus sitting on a table based around a television, with adjacent speaker and control panel, adorned with wires and electronics at the back, and an array of aerials on top. After the Doctor presses a few buttons, the machine comes to life and an antenna rotates. Nation's original name for it as mentioned by the Doctor, is a time curve visiscope. The Doctor considers it a simple toy and explains that it converts neutrons of light energy into electrical impulses, the practical upshot of which is that it allows you to view the past. It's explained that with the visiscope, you can tune in to any event in history. As long as it's already happened, it can be shown on the screen. The crucial piece of dialogue in this early version of the script is that where the Doctor comes from, children made these things as a hobby. This snippet of dialogue about the race we later find out are called Time Lords would have constituted one of the earliest hints about the culture of the Doctor's people, that they consider peering through time to be literally child's play. Stop for a moment to consider the implications of such a device. This would create mind-boggling privacy concerns. Not just in <coughs> personal ways, but in the broader context of governmental control, if someone had the power to check what any individual had done at any point in their lives, then all forms of conspiracy would be futile, and control through espionage and blackmail could be absolute. It would also make any civilization an instant galactic superpower, since they could not only control through stealthy means, but they could repel any military onslaught by using the visiscope to eavesdrop on their enemies in the recent past determine their weaknesses, and pick up both technological and tactical advantages. This would be a much more insidious method than, for example, using a time machine to travel back to try to carry out a commando-style mission to defeat their enemies before they arise, as this type of operation could be more easily detected and has the potential to be foiled. The visiscope method would be undetectable. The Time Lord's casual approach to both privacy and causality is touched upon again at the end of The Moon Base. In this story, the Doctor suddenly mentions that the TARDIS has an inbuilt system called a Time Scanner, 
The what? The time scanner. Which provides a glimpse of the future. <clears throat> the second sight. Very dangerous. This allows them to get a look at the monster they will meet in the next adventure. <laughs> A similar function was shown in episode 1 of The Wheel in Space, where the TARDIS warns of impending danger after they've landed, and it subtly suggests they should take off again by showing tempting images of nicer places. What's going on? Oh dear. Those pictures aren't what's happening outside, I'm certain of that. Well, why do they keep appearing then? They're temptations. The TARDIS is trying to warn us to get away from here to somewhere more pleasant. I must have. Push the wrong switch. The red light stopped flashing. What? Something must be wrong. In later stories, it would become clear that the Time Lords do indeed seem to have visiscope technology. The technician in the Three Doctors only has to press a button to see a moment in the Doctor's timeline. And in the Five Doctors, the technology behind the time scoop can clearly see any point in history as well as remove things from it. At the end of The Wheel in Space, the Doctor claims he's going to project his memories of a previous adventure onto the TARDIS screen and weave them into a story for Zoe. But the very first event we see on the screen is a scene which the Doctor never witnessed himself. This would appear to suggest that the Doctor is lying about how these images were collected, not from his memories at all, but perhaps using technology just like the visiscope. There is another explanation as to where these pictures come from. Since the TARDIS had actually been somewhere nearby at the time of these events, perhaps it collected all the data that is shown to Zoe. Later, in the Trial of a Time Lord, it is confirmed that the Matrix on Gallifrey can indeed access the thoughts and memories of anyone in range of the collection field of a TARDIS. This is even more terrifying than just spying on you, as they can actually read your mind as well. Instant access to all historical information makes a mockery of the deadly assassin in which we see the laborious process of highly fallible and subjective eyewitness testimony being used to try to determine events that recently took place. With all the technology at hand, it should be a simple matter to re-watch the events and see exactly what happened, or indeed just probe the doctor's mind for the truth, or simply look at the footage from one of the cameras. Returning to the story which first introduces this nightmarish machine, in Nation's draft of the chase, his idea is that the Doctor has the ability to knock up one of these all-powerful surveillance devices just for fun. And as we've discussed, this would be very handy if you were, say, a master manipulator who always needed to stay one step ahead of your enemies. In this low-key way, Terry Nation was therefore the first Doctor Who writer to touch upon the attitudes of a race of beings who had the ability to construct time machines and how these skills might bleed into the rest of their lives. But rather than go down this very dark rabbit hole about blackmail and oppression, it's thankfully played off as a bit of light fun. Ultimately, and sadly, this neat piece of backstory about the toys of the time tots was lost because story editor Dennis Spooner decided not to retain Nation's dialogue about them being children's playthings. Instead of the Doctor spontaneously inventing it at the start of the chase, it was decided that its origin would be explained at the end of the previous adventure and it would also receive a name change too. Therefore, in the penultimate scene of the preceding The Space Museum, the Doctor says that he has been given a gift as a souvenir, called a time and space visualizer. The Doctor has seen them before, and its manufacturer is never stated, so it could arguably still be the product of the Doctor's own people. Although, how the prop would ultimately be realised for the production would cast doubt on this and raise more questions than answers. In his original script, as well as describing its overall appearance as something of a tabletop lash-up, Nation also outlines the user interface. For the first historical event that they want to look at, the Doctor moves to the control panel which has a long list of planet names and uses a pointer to select Earth. It's interesting to wonder what Nation had in mind when he wrote there would be a long list of planet names. How many planets might this visiscope have access to? Our galaxy alone, the Milky Way, has around 300 billion suns, 
and in the universe of Doctor Who, extraterrestrial life is commonplace. So let's arbitrarily say that one in five suns have habitable planets, and half of them have developed into something worth spying on. That would produce a list of 30 billion planet names to have written on the control panel, which would require a really small font. But this is not how the machine was realised for the final production, and the decisions made in bringing it to screen present some issues within the continuity of the story. There were two designers assigned to the chase, Ray Cusick, the original designer of the Daleks, and John Wood, who had previously worked on the web planet. On the production design sheet for the space-time visualizer, which we have approximated here in a mock-up, both the designers are credited at the top of the page. It is John Wood's name in the main box, suggesting he designed the visualizer. The only aspect of Nation's description which was retained was the necessary television screen for viewing the images. The rest was very different, becoming a visually striking, large, circular shape themed to look like a giant eye. Wood indicated the outer lip at the bottom, the lower eyelid if you like, would have a series of practical levers, then a set of smaller flick switches on the next lip, and then a ring of slots for memory cards, which we'll come to in a moment. Only three slots were practical, and the rest were painted on. The upper eyelid was to have a perspex front and moving light sequence behind it. The pupil at the centre was of course the screen, designed to have a circle of coloured perspex with a rounded rectangular frame and a circular frame inside that. A TV monitor on a trolley was housed behind it. And what about the 30 billion planet names? The design drawing actually shows no planet names at all. Wood's concept sketches were drawn up into full designs by draftsman Nigel Curzon to be handed over to Shawcraft Models of Uxbridge. And the only other clue we have about the planet labels was a note that Shawcraft needed to discuss the painting and instrument details with the designer. The visualizer they constructed did not exactly follow the design plan, although it only really differed in the details. It's not entirely clear on screen, but the intention was that the stored memory cards would form a complete ring around the edge of the prop. There were three practical slots to be left empty at the bottom, about 30 fakes to represent the edges of stored cards, and the rest were merely painted strips. When needed, a card would be removed from the storage ring and placed in the central card reading slot. The prop was ready for its first studio use on the 30th of April 1965 in Riverside 1. It's safe to assume that the design department didn't consult with Nation on the construction of this prop and didn't find out what fantastical ideas he had regarding planet names. So whoever made the final decision on its labels made a valiant attempt to apply some proper science to this magical machine, and they used real planet names. The final prop featured only eight worlds on the front, all of which are from our solar system, although bizarrely excluding Mercury. This laudable attempt to inject some realism creates a conceptual issue with the device in the story, because it means it must have been built by humans, or Martians or Venusians, to gaze through the history of our own solar system, or it was made by an outside race intent on spying specifically on us, or Martians or Venusians. But since all the events the characters decide to view would be from Earth history anyway, putting any planet names beyond our own would actually have been redundant. So with the focus being on Earth events, in the transmitted version of the episode, Ian is the first to select a place for the machine to view, and he naturally chooses Earth. But in practical terms, how exactly could this system work? Ian merely has to say Pennsylvania on the 19th of November 1863, and somehow the visualizer produces the exact spot and the precise second which was desired in order to show Abraham Lincoln's famous Gettysburg Address. In Nation's original draft, he makes the location system slightly more logical, although somewhat more improbable. The Doctor has to dig out a memory card with a map of Pennsylvania and insert it into the machine, and then Ian has to use a positioning device to zero in on the desired location. Firstly, this begs the question as to whether the Doctor has maps of every square mile of every planet in the galaxy. And secondly, 
Even with quite a high resolution map, it seems highly unlikely that the exact place could be pinpointed. Ian would need to recognise the location down to a few feet based on an aerial view, and also, if he assumed Lincoln stood where the Gettysburg Address Memorial was located, then he'd be out by 300 yards, because the memorial is not where the actual speech took place. If you really want to nitpick, and who doesn't, you could also ask how does the machine know which way to point its camera? Maybe Ian wanted to see his grandfather who might have been standing in the front row. Nevertheless, Ian gets to see Lincoln and cannot believe his luck. The footage of Lincoln was not an actor in a different part of the studio played in live, but instead a sequence which was pre-filmed at Ealing Studios just over two weeks earlier. Normally the director would make most of the decisions about what needed filming ahead of time, but on this occasion, because director Richard Martin was away, the producer herself, Verity Lambert, liaised with the design department to make some of these arrangements. These plans were drawn up on the 3rd of March, a good six weeks ahead of any filming taking place, so that design work could be prioritised according to what was being shot first. The next use of the machine differs between Nation's original draft and the broadcast version modified by Dennis Spooner. In Spooner's final version, Barbara wants to spy on Shakespeare meeting Queen Elizabeth I. This raises even more questions about how successfully you could ever locate a specific individual, since the whereabouts of these two at any given moment in history are not well documented, and in fact there's no evidence that they ever even met, but there's supposition that they crossed paths in the late 1590s when Shakespeare's troupe was popular at court. So doing even better than Ian's success locating the Gettysburg Address, which had a known time and place, Barbara somehow manages to zero in on a private meeting between Her Majesty and the Bard. And she gets it right to the very moment, because he leaves the location quickly afterwards. But in Nation's original draft, the achievement is even more extraordinary. In his version, Barbara went looking for a specific conversation and somehow found it. At the time of writing the chase, there had been a resurgence in the conspiracy theory that Shakespeare didn't write the plays which bear his name, and that Francis Bacon was the true author, as if Bacon didn't have enough to do writing his own enormous body of scientific and philosophical work, he was also apparently secretly writing whimsical poetry about fairies and ghosts. In Nation's version of the Shakespeare scene, Barbara wanted to settle this question of authorship and therefore she provides a time and place for the Visiscope to show a secret meeting between Shakespeare and Bacon. This is clearly even more impossible than locating a meeting between Shakespeare and the Queen, however, sure enough, the screen comes on and in that exact moment we see Shakespeare hand over a payment and Bacon hand over the manuscript for Hamlet, although Shakespeare doesn't like the title and wants to call it The Blooded Dagger. Ian and Barbara believe they've finally witnessed the truth of the matter. Bacon is the real author of Shakespeare's plays. But then there's a twist, and one which somewhat undermines the whole marvel of the Visiscope. The Doctor explains that the exchange of money that they just witnessed and the handing over of the play manuscript was a charade. The Doctor says that Shakespeare and Bacon did this because they knew people nearby would overhear their conversation and it would create controversy and therefore drum up publicity to get bums on seats. He didn't say bums on seats. And how does the Doctor know this? Because Shakespeare told him personally. Because the Doctor has a time machine, of course. A fact which seems to be forgotten as the time travellers all stare in awe at a small TV screen showing historical events. It highlights how nonsensical it is that Ian's mind is blown that he got to hear Abraham Lincoln speak because he was recently chatting to Richard the Lionheart and hanging out in a bar with Napoleon Bonaparte. Why is it so incredible to see a historical person on TV when they lead a lifestyle where they can interact with these people? Perhaps story editor Dennis Spooner saw how these extra comments from the Doctor highlighted the illogic of the character's excitement at the Visiscope, or perhaps he resented giving the Bacon conspiracy the oxygen of publicity, but for whatever reason, he chose to remove all the material about the authorship of Shakespeare's plays. But he does make a slight concession to it at the end of the scene in the broadcast version by having Bacon suggest an idea for a play about Hamlet, and Shakespeare steals the idea. There's a lack of thoroughness in the Spooner rewrite, 
In his changed version, with the conspiracy theory removed, Barbara's spying on Shakespeare wasn't motivated by any particular investigation. Having witnessed Shakespeare chatting to Bacon, there's no triumphant conclusion to the scene. So when Ian then asks Barbara if she found out what she wanted to know, it ends rather limply with her replying, I didn't really want to know anything. In addition to delving into the past, Nation wanted to end the Visiscope scene with a little joke about how the 20th century would be viewed in the future. The companion Vicky was from the 25th century, and her comments about the era of Ian and Barbara would give pause for thought about how our present day will be someone else's history. One of the initial ideas for this scene was for them to view a speech by Winston Churchill, which could be given an amusing spin, but it's likely that talk of politics and the war was considered a little too heavy, and so it was decided that a different scene would perform the same function, but in a more light-hearted manner. This final sequence with the surveillance machine sees Vicky's turn to use it, and she tunes in to a broadcast from Earth. In Nation's original draft, the announcer on the Visiscope says, Good evening. This is the tridimensional colour television service of the BBC. Nation would reuse the name of this futuristic format, albeit slightly altered, in his draft script for the Daleks' master plan. In episode 7, Stephen uses a slight variation, saying, Trimensional Colorvision. Nation borrowed the term trimensional from Isaac Asimov as a result of reading and adapting the novelist's work for television about a year earlier. In the spring of 1964, Nation had been commissioned to write a screenplay based on Asimov's novel The Caves of Steel as part of the anthology series Story Parade. The characters have video calls using what's referred to as a trimensional image. Later reviewers and other analysts would often write the word incorrectly, using the more logical but less eloquent tri-dimensional, so Nation was not alone in using both versions. The Story Parade episode of Caves of Steel, which starred Peter Cushing and John Carson, is now sadly lost, but this photo shows trimensional subcontrol on a sign in the background. The screenplay for Caves of Steel was much on Nation's mind during 1965, and he even mentions it by name in his script for episode 1 of the Daleks' master plan, in reference to the way the view screen should be realised. And here we get a third variation of the word, tri vision. In his script, Nation suggests using a strobe light on a live actor situated behind the screen, which was the method used in the production of Caves of Steel to create a flickering hologram. This was not merely a trivial detail, but a plot point within Asimov's books, because there had to be a distinction between Earth's trimensional images and those of the technically superior colonies whose holograms are perfectly realistic. Notably, these colonies in Asimov's books are called the Outer Worlds, which is another term nation borrowed for the Daleks' master plan, although it was later changed to the Outer Galaxies, but that's a topic for a forthcoming video. The trimensional term borrowed from Asimov was removed from the scripts of both the Chase and the Daleks' master plan before the final version, perhaps because of potential copyright issues. But cutting back to the Chase and the tri-dimensional colour vision of Nation's draft, the TARDIS crew are viewing the year 1994, and the announcer reveals their guests tonight are the Beatles. Four very old men with white Beatles haircuts and beards start to play. Although Nation's draft doesn't make clear whether he expected to secure the real Beatles or if he was imagining it before elderly actors, the production team did subsequently have hopes that the band would be available to appear in person. Verity Lambert drew up a filming schedule on the 3rd of March, which included a Beatles sequence being shot specially for the chase, with the band standing in front of a plain background. But at some point over the following month, these hopes evaporated, according to legend because of Brian Epstein's intervention. As a fallback, the Doctor Who production team tried to secure a Beatles performance from Top of the Pops, but it was discovered that all bar one of their appearances had already been wiped. The remaining performance of I Feel Fine could not be used because it had already been used the contracted number of times. This kind of restriction illustrates one of the many issues surrounding the retention of recordings back in the 1960s, Unions feared that excessive repeats could put actors and musicians out of jobs, 
which added to the various other technical and cultural reasons that archiving TV shows was not necessarily desirable. As a final option, it was noted that the Beatles would be recording again for Top of the Pops on the 10th of April at Riverside 2 in the neighbouring studio to where the chase was to be videotaped three weeks later. Ultimately, this would indeed be the material that was used, after Brian Epstein's agreement of course. The earliest material shot specifically for the chase was captured at Camber Sands, as detailed in our earliest video. So this footage on the sand dunes was captured the day before this Beatles performance, and a couple of days after the Beatles sang their new single, Ticket to Ride, at Riverside, Abraham Lincoln's speech was filmed at Ealing. After their pre-recorded appearance on Top of the Pops, the videotapes were wiped as usual for reuse. Ironically, the use of this clip in Doctor Who meant that for many years this material was the only surviving footage of the Beatles performing on Top of the Pops. Following the delight at seeing this classical music performance, the time travellers are distracted from the time-space visualiser because the TARDIS has landed. Vicky and Ian go off to explore, leaving Barbara and the Doctor to sunbathe, and when Barbara goes back into the ship, the visualiser provides a new image, Daleks in a control room. As mentioned, the space-time visualiser prop used in studio only has settings which allowed for visualisation of eight locations in our solar system, so where is this meant to be? If the controls on the front show only places on which the machine can focus, then the Daleks must logically be operating from a secret base inside our solar system, but it's safe to assume the intention in this scene is actually that the Daleks are on their home planet, and this inconsistency is the result of the design of the machine. As to whose fault that was, perhaps Nation was a little short-sighted to specify in his script that there should be a long list of planet names without actually providing them, leaving the BBC design department to dig out whatever books they could find to help them realise the interface of this fantastical machine. As Barbara and the Doctor spy on the Daleks, we see that the Daleks have their own remote viewing system and they are spying on the TARDIS. Which brings us to the true function of the space-time visualiser within the storyline to forewarn our heroes of the impending threat that they face and significantly increase the tension. The screen shows that the Daleks now have a time machine of their own and intend to hunt down the Doctor. Nation's inspired concept of a time television not only introduced the danger at the start of the story, but it was also used to bookend the events in Episode 6. On the 4th of June, the cumbersome prop was wheeled back into studio for the coda in which the Doctor and Vicky watch Ian and Barbara restart their lives on Earth. A happy moment to behold, as long as you don't think too hard about the Doctor being able to tune in and spy on you anytime he likes. <laughs>